Between 1974 and 1991, a series of murders took place in Wichita and Park City, Kansas that paralyzed the state with fear. Ten people would be killed by this sick creature, and police were taunted by gloating letters bragging of the heinous acts committed against the victims. In one of these letters, the killer gave himself a nickname based on his method of murder. Dennis Rader, the BTK killer with the motto, bind them, torture them, kill them. Dennis Rader was born on March 9th, 1945, just months before the end of World War II in Pittsburgh, Kansas. He was the first of four boys that the family would have. He later reported that due to the long hours that his parents worked, he felt ignored by his parents, especially his mother. Some aspects of his childhood were fairly normal, such as being in the Boy Scouts, and the people that knew him as a youth described him as quiet and polite. Yet, even as a child, Raider was developing sick and sadistic fantasies of murder. In his mind, he was tying up and torturing various women, including one of the girls he saw on the Disney's Mouseketeer show. Raider would also later report that during this time, he was killing neighborhood pets using ropes. Eventually, the Raider family moved to Wichita and Dennis attended Wichita Heights High School, graduating in 1963. After graduation, Dennis Raider worked some jobs and attended Kansas Wesleyan College for two semesters in 1965. After his brief stint in college, the 21-year-old Raider joined the Air Force in 1966. While in the military, Raider was stationed around the world. He spent the last two years of his service at a base near Tokyo, Japan, until he transferred to the reserves in 1970. While in the reserves, Raider was back in Wichita, Kansas. In 1971, Raider married a woman named Paula Dietz. He spent the next two years working various jobs, such as a supermarket butcher, a job at Coleman Camping Supplies, before eventually earning an associate's degree in electronics in 1973 from the Butler County Community College. He would go on to study at Wichita State but took six years to earn a degree. After being fired from his job at Cessna Aircraft in 1973, Raider fell into darkness. He began spending more time in his violent fantasies. After dropping off his wife at work, Raider would cruise neighborhoods looking for women to follow. He later described how he would fantasize about breaking into their homes and torturing them to death. It was during one of these hunts that he noticed Julie Otero. The Otero family had recently moved into the neighborhood. Julie Otero had also worked at Coleman Camping Supplies, but it is unlikely that she knew Raider. She and her husband Joseph had five kids, and two of them were home when Dennis Raider committed his first murders. During this time, he was working at ADT Security and had an intimate knowledge of the methods used to protect homes and their owners. On January 15th of 1974, Dennis prepared what he called his hit kit and parked a short way from the Otero home. The bag he carried had a gun, ropes, and knives inside. He snuck up to the house and cut the phone line before breaking in. He found his target Julie and the 11-year-old daughter Josephine home, but also Julie's husband Joseph and their nine-year-old son Joey. Raider told them that he was there to rob them and that after he got their money and car, he would leave them unharmed. Raider then shepherded the family into a bedroom and tied them up. They believed he would leave them after robbing them until he placed a plastic bag over Joseph's head to suffocate him. Joseph fought and tore the bag, which led Raider to use a rope to strangle him in front of his family. He then turned on Julie Otero and tried to strangle her twice before he was successful. He then turned his murderous attention on Joey. He took the boy into a different bedroom and killed him by suffocation. During his confession, Redder stated that he sat in a chair and watched the nine-year-old die. The last of the Otero to die that day was 11-year-old Josephine. After failing to manually strangle her, Raider took her into the basement and hung her from a pipe. He became excited as he watched her struggle and left fluids behind at the scene. In an effort to conceal his movements, Raider cleaned up the house and took the Otero's car. He parked it at a nearby grocery store and a witness saw him throw the keys onto the roof. This plan was foiled when he realized that one of his knives was missing, so he drove back in his own car to the house and parked inside the garage while he found the weapon. The horrors were not yet over for the Otero family. 
The three surviving children would find their family dead when they got home from school that day. They were 13, 14, and 15 years old and forever traumatized by what they saw. Now that he had crossed the line and committed murder, Dennis Rader began thinking of how he could tailor his kills. He wanted to find his ideal victim type, and for his next victim, he chose 21-year-old Catherine Bright. On April 4th, 1974, he made his move. When she was away from home, Rader broke in and hid himself in a bedroom to wait for Catherine to return. She came home in the early afternoon accompanied by her 19-year-old brother named Kevin. Rader confronted the pair and gave them the same line that he had given the Oteros about being a criminal on the run and that he was only there to rob them. With gun in hand, he forced them into a bedroom and tied up Catherine before tying up her brother in a different room. Rader had not brought his murder kit and was forced to use items he found in the house. Kevin was able to free himself and rushed at Rader in an attempt to take his firearm. After a struggle, Rader shot Kevin twice in the head, which caused him to collapse to the floor. Now shaken, Rader did not take the time to strangle Catherine as he had planned, but instead stabbed her in the stomach and back. While the depraved killer was occupied with Catherine, her brother Kevin regained consciousness and ran out of the house, dazed and bloody. Rader fled, running to his car, which was parked in the neighborhood and speeding away. Catherine Bright passed away hours later in the hospital, while her brother barely survived the ordeal. Over the next few months, three men confessed to the Otero murders and were put in custody. This was too much for the disgusting killer as he wanted credit for his kills. The local newspaper, the Wichita Eagle, received a bizarre phone call. The unknown person told the editor to look inside a specific book at the library. When the police caught wind, they rushed to the library and inside the mechanical engineering book that the caller had specified was a letter stuffed between the pages. The letter contained a graphic description of the murders of the Otero family with information only the killer could have known. The killer also taunted the police and proclaimed the innocence of the three men in custody. As one reads the letter, it is apparent that the depraved creature wanted fame and media coverage through his murders. Rader described a monster inside of him which drove him to murder. He signed off with the ominous statement that the code words for me will be bind them, torture them, kill them, BTK, they will be on the next victim. On March 17, 1977, the creature struck again. His initial target was unavailable, and so he walked through a neighborhood until he came across a young boy. Rader showed the five-year-old Steve Ralford a photo of his own family and asked if he knew where they lived. The boy said no, and the killer watched him walk home, then approached the house soon after and knocked on the front door. Posing as a private investigator, Rader talked his way into the home when Steve answered the door. Inside, he found two other children and their mother, Shirley Vianne. When she came out of a back room, she was confronted by the barrel of a gun. She was homesick and bewildered as the monster explained that he had a sexual problem and that he would leave after he assaulted her. Shirley saw through the ruse, but for the sake of her kids, she went along with Rader's commands. They put the children in a bathroom with toys and blankets and then went to one of the bedrooms. Shirley smoked a cigarette and Rader even gave her a glass of water after she vomited. He then tied her up and calmly placed a plastic bag over her head before strangling her with a rope. The children had told Rader that their neighbor was going to check in on them. So when Rader heard the phone ring, he packed up his murder tools and left. The monster climbed into his car and escaped as the children forced their way out of the bathroom to find the horrors that he had left behind. The next person who Rader targeted was 25-year-old Nancy Fox. On December 8, 1977, the creature cut her phone line and broke into her home. He waited inside her kitchen until she returned home from work. Then, with gun in hand, Rader commanded her to disrobe and then tied her up in the bedroom. Once she was defenseless, the monster strangled her with a pair of pantyhose, and as he did so, he told her that he had killed before. One day later, unsatisfied with the fact that Nancy Fox's body had not yet been discovered, Raider took things into his own hands. On his way to work, he stopped and reported the murder himself. Yes, you will find a homicide at 43 South Pershing, Nancy Fox. I'm sorry, sir, I can't understand you. What is your address? 843 South Pershing. When police arrived, they found the dead woman in her bedroom. 
there was a stain of human fluids on the nightgown beside her nude body. However, an autopsy found that she had not been sexually assaulted. After the discovery, Rader began corresponding with the media through disgusting letters and poems about his victims. On January 31, 1978, a letter arrived at the Wichita Eagle. It was an index card with a poem entitled, Shirley Locks. The mail clerk did not make the connection to the murder of Shirley Vianne and filed it with the classified department, assuming it was a Valentine's Day note. When the poem did not spark outrage, the killer tried something more direct. Instead of a poem that alluded to his victim, Rader wrote a letter to a local news channel. The letter asked the question, how many more people do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper or some national attention? It also included potential nicknames such as the BTK Strangler and the Wichita Hangman. In the letter, Raider also claimed that he was driven to kill by what he called Factor X, wrote that this Factor X was what had led to the Jack the Ripper murders in London in the late 1880s, the son of Sam shootings in New York, and the Hillside Strangler murders. During this time frame, there was also a poem riddled with spelling and grammatical errors sent to the media titled Ode Death to Nancy. More than a year would pass before the BTK killer tried to strike again. On April 28, 1979, a 63-year-old woman named Anna Williams got home late. She found that her home had been broken into, and then a couple months later, some of her stolen belongings arrived in the mail with a note. The note said how disappointed the killer was that Anna had not come home before he had to leave. There was another poem filled with misspelled words. This one was titled, Oh Anna, Why Didn't You Appear? In August of 1979, the police were getting exasperated by the hunt for the elusive serial killer. They began broadcasting the recording of the call he made in 1977 to report the murder of Nancy Fox. Despite the high volume of tips resulting from their efforts, none led to the disgusting creature's capture. A task force was formed in 1984 to catch the killer who was taunting the police. It was named the Ghostbusters. They began to categorize and sift through the evidence collected on the killer, cross-referencing it against other murders that fit the pattern of the BTK killer. There was not another murder until 1985, this time much closer to Raider's home. 52-year-old Maureen Hedge lived just down the street from the BTK killer, and he had been watching her. The two were casual acquaintances from the neighborhood, and on April 27th of 1985, he made his move. After creating an alibi by pretending to go bowling, Raider took a taxi to Maureen's house. He broke in and concealed himself in a closet, waiting for her to return. Raider listened as she and a visitor entered the house and waited until the guest had left and Maureen went to bed. Then he rushed in, flashing on the lights before leaping onto her and strangling her to death with his bare hands. What came next was one of the most horrific acts of the BTK Strangler. Raider took Maureen Hedge's body to the Christ Lutheran Church, which he served as a deacon at. There he posed her in various depraved and sadistic positions and photographed her using a Polaroid camera. When he was done, the depraved killer left her body in a ditch on the side of the road nearby, covered with some brush. The next to fall prey to the depraved killer was a 28-year-old woman named Vicki Wegerly. On September 16, 1986, Raider picked her from a list of potential victims and put his murderous plan into action. He dressed up as an employee of the phone company and knocked on Vicky's front door and asked her if he could come in and check her phone lines. Once inside the house, Raider fiddled with the phone until she turned her back to him. At this point, he pulled a 357 Magnum handgun and pointed it at her. The creature then took her into a bedroom and tied her up. However, Vicky broke free and a violent struggle ensued. Eventually, Raider was able to wrap a stocking around her neck and strangled her until he thought she was dead. Once again, the killer repositioned his victim and took photographs. By that time, he feared that the noise of their fight and the dogs barking in the backyard would draw attention to the house, so he took Vicky's car and drove away. When Vicky was discovered, she was still barely hanging on to life. Paramedics were rushed to the scene, but unfortunately they were unable to resuscitate her, and as a result of the attack, she died. There would be no murders for five years, although Dennis Rader did comment on another murder case. Three members of the Fager family were murdered in 1988. Mary Fager entered her home on the 31st of December to find that her husband, Philip, and two daughters, 
16-year-old Sherry and 9-year-old Kelly had been murdered. Her husband had been executed with two gunshots to the head while the girls had been strangled. The distraught widow received a letter shortly after the killings in which the author claimed to be BTK. He said that he was not responsible for the murder of her family, but that he admired whoever had done it. In 2005, it was confirmed that Dennis Rader had written this letter. Before he would kill again, the disgusting monster would target a variety of potential victims. At this time, he was a Cub Scout leader and working as a dog catcher and compliance officer in Park City, Kansas. He was known to bully and harass single women, with one of them claiming that he had killed her dog without a reason. Two of them would file restraining orders against him, but his murderous desires would go unfulfilled until 1991 when he killed again. On the night of January 9th, 1991, 62-year-old Dolores Davis was at home, less than two miles from where Raider lived. After lurking outside for a while, deciding how he would get in, he used a cinder block to smash through a window on the patio door, then unlocked it and walked in. Dolores came running out of her bedroom to see what had caused all the noise. Raider later reported that Davis initially thought that someone had crashed into her house, but the truth was much worse. He forced her back into the bedroom and handcuffed her. He used the story that he was on the run from police and just needed her car, some food, and a warm up. Once she was restrained, he rummaged through her personal belongings and eventually removed the handcuffs in favor of ropes and strangled her to death with a pair of pantyhose. After the murder, the killer once again loaded her body into the trunk of a car. This time, it was her own. He hid her body before parking the car back at her house as he found one of the guns that he had lost during the break-in. Once he found it, he went back to his own car, then collected Davis's body and dumped her under a bridge. There were no more murders and no more communications until 2004 when Raider resumed his correspondence with the Wichita Eagle. A letter with the name Bill Thomas Kilman, named as the sender in the return address, arrived in March of that year. It claimed responsibility for the murder of Vicki Weggerly and included a photocopy of her stolen driver's license and the photos of the murder scene that the killer had taken. Until this letter, police were unsure whether the killer known as BTK was responsible for Weggerly's murder. In May of 2004, the killer sent a letter to a local news station, which included chapter titles for a potential BTK book. And a month later, a package was discovered taped to a stop sign, which contained a chapter from the killer's proposed book, as well as a detailed description of the Otero murders. The killer seemed to be reveling in the attention that this correspondence had created, and in July, he put a package into the return slot at a local library which, among other things, claimed responsibility for the murder of a 19-year-old named Jake Allen. This claim turned out to be false, and Allen's death was ruled a suicide. An autobiography was left in a UPS box in October, which was filled with misleading information about the killer. Along with the biography were photos of children with expressions of fear on their faces, and some were tied up. In December, another package was discovered. This time, the killer left the driver's license of Nancy Fox and a Barbie doll with the hands and feet bound and a plastic bag over its head. In January of 2005, the killer was seen on a surveillance camera, leaving a cereal box with more twisted writings in the bed of a truck in a Home Depot parking lot. His identity was unclear from the video, but investigators were able to learn that the killer had been driving a black Jeep Cherokee. After sending a variety of postcards and symbolically bound dolls, the killer asked police in a letter whether they would be able to trace a floppy disk if he left them one. The police, eager to capitalize on the killer's idiocy, responded that a floppy disk would be safe for him to use without being caught. On February 16, 2005, a package arrived at a local news station which included a floppy disk, a necklace, and a copy of the cover of a book called Rules of Prey which was about a serial killer. Police were able to discover data on the floppy disk that the depraved monster was unaware of, which indicated that the computer used to create it was from the Christ Lutheran Church, and the user was listed as Dennis. The pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place for the police as they learned that Dennis Rader was the president of the church council and that he drove a black Jeep Cherokee. Nearing the level of evidence needed to arrest and charge Rader, police obtained a warrant to collect DNA evidence from a recent procedure performed on his daughter. 
This confirmed a familial match between the daughter and the person who left DNA behind at the Vicky Wegerly crime scene. On the 25th of February, 2005, Raider was arrested. His home and vehicle were searched and his computer was seized. When asked if he knew why he was being arrested, Raider replied, I have suspicions why. On the 28th of February, Raider was charged with 10 counts of murder and bail was set at $10 million. During his trial, which began on June 27th, Raider gave a detailed account of each of the murders as if he was describing what he had done over the summer with no emotion or remorse. He was found guilty and sentenced to 10 life terms due to Kansas not having a death penalty at the time. Raider was sent to the El Dorado Correctional Facility and put into solitary confinement. He is still at this facility and his earliest possible parole date is February 26 in the year 2180. I need to find out more information. On that particular day, the 15th day of January, 1974, can you tell me where you went to kill Mr. Joseph Otero? Mm, I think it's 1834, uh, Edgemore. All right, can you tell me approximately what time of day you went there? Uh, somewhere between seven and 7.30. This particular location, did you know these people? No, that's, uh, no, that was part of my, uh, I guess my, what you call fantasy. These people were uh, selected. All right, so you, okay. okay, you were engaged in some kind of fantasy during this period of time? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Now, when you use the term fantasy, is this something you were doing for your personal pleasure? Uh, sexual fantasy, sir. I see. So, you went to this residence, and what occurred then? Well, <clears throat> uh, I had uh, did some uh, thinking on what I was going to do to uh, either Mrs. Otero or Josephine, and... Uh, basically broke into the house, or didn't break into the house, but uh, when they came out of the house, I came in and confronted the family, and then we went from there. All right. Had you planned this beforehand? To some degree, yes. Uh, after I got in the house, it, well, I lost control of it, but it, it was, you know, in the back of my mind, I had some ideas what I was going to do, did but uh, I just, I basically panicked that first day, so. Beforehand, did you know who was there in the house? I thought Mrs. Otero and the two kids, the uh, two younger kids were in the house. I didn't realize Mr. Otero was going to be there. All right. How did you get into the house? I came through the back door, uh, cut the phone lines, uh, waited at the back door, had reservations about even going or just walking away, but pretty soon the door opened and I was in. All right. So the door opened, was it open for you or did something? I think one of the kids, I think the uh, ju uh, junior or not junior, yes, the, uh, the young girl, uh, Joseph, opened the door. He probably let the dog out because the dog was in the house at that time. All right, when you went into the house, what happened then? Well, I confronted the family, uh, pulled a pistol, uh, confronted Mr. Otero, and uh, asked him to, uh, you know, that I was there to basically, I was uh, wanted, uh, wanted to, uh, get the car, I was hungry, food, I was wanted, and I asked him to lie down in the uh, living room. And uh, at that time I realized that wouldn't be a really good idea. So I finally, the dog was a real problem, so I uh, asked Mr. Otero if he could get the dog out. So he had one of the kids put it out. And then I took him back to the bedroom. You took who back to the bedroom? Uh, the family, to the bedroom, the four members. All right, what happened then? And at that time I tied him up. While still holding him at gunpoint? Well, in between tying and yes, yeah. All right, after you tied them up, what occurred? Okay. Well, uh, they started complaining about uh, being tied up, and I re-loosened re the bonds a couple of times. Uh, tried to make Mr. Otero as comfortable as I could. Uh, apparently he had a cracked rib from a car accident, so I had him put a pillow down on for his head. Uh, had he put a, uh, I think he's a parker or a coat underneath him. Uh, 
they, uh, you know, they talked to me about, uh, uh, you know, giving the car and whatever money. I guess they didn't have very much money. And uh, the, uh, there I realized that, uh, you know, I was already, I didn't have a mask on or anything. They already could ID me and uh, uh, made, a, made a decision to go ahead and, and uh, put them down, I guess, or strangle them. All right. What did you do to Joseph Otero? Senior? Joseph Otero? Yeah, okay. Joseph Otero Sr., Mr. Otero, the father. I uh, put a plastic bag over his head and then some cords and then tightened it. And this was in the bedroom? Yes, sir. Did he, in fact, uh, suffocate and die as a result of this? Not right away. No, sir, he didn't. What happened? Uh, well, after that, I, uh, I did miss this Otero. Uh, I had never strangled anyone before, so I really didn't know how much pressure you had to put on a person or how long it would take. But Was she also tied up there in the yes, bedroom? Yes, uh -huh. yeah, both her hands and their feet were tied up. She was on the bed. Where were the children? Uh, well, uh, Josephine was on the bed and uh, Junior was on the floor at this time. So we're, we're talking, first of all, about Joseph Otero. So you put the bag over his head and tied it, mm -hmm. and he did not die right away. Can you tell me what happened in regards to Joseph uh, He moved over real quick, like, and I think tore a hole in the bag, and I could tell that he was having some problems there. But at that time, the, the whole family just went, uh, they went panicked on me, so I, I worked pretty quick. Uh, what did you, uh, you worked pretty quick. Well, what I mean, I, 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 I strangled <coughs> Mrs. Otero, and she went out, or passed out. I thought she was dead. She passed out. Then I strangled uh, uh, Josephine. She passed out, or I thought she was dead. And uh, then I went over and uh, put a, uh, and then uh, put a bag on uh, uh, Junior's head, and uh, and then uh, if I remember right, uh, Mrs. Otero came back. Uh, she came back and... Uh, Sir, let me ask you about Joseph Otero Sr. You senior. indicated he had torn a hole in the bag. Mm -hmm. and what did you do with him then? I put another bag over it, or either that or a... If I recollect, I think I put a uh, either a cloth or a T-shirt or something over it, over his head, and then a bag, another bag. Did, and then he, sub down. did he subsequently die? Well, yes. I mean, I, I mean, I was, I didn't just stay there and watch him, then I was moving around the room, but. All right, so you indicated you strangled Mrs. Otero after you had done this, is that correct? Now I went back and strangled her again, right. and that, that finally killed her at that time. So this is in regards to count two. You had, first of all, put the bag over Joseph Otero's head, mm -hmm. and he tore a hole in the bag. Mm -hmm. Then you went ahead did you strangle Mrs. Otero then, okay. or did you go first back? Of all, first of all, Mr. Otero was strangled, or a bag put over his head and strangled. Then I thought he was going down, and I went over and strangled Mrs. Otero, and I thought she was down. Then I strangled uh, uh, Josephine, thought she was down, and then I went over to Junior and put the bag on his head. After that, Mrs. Otero woke back up, and, uh, you know, she was pretty upset at what's going on. So I came back and uh, at that point in time strangled her uh, for, for the death strangle at that time. With your hands or what? No, with a cord, with a, with a rope. And uh, then I, uh, I think at that point in time I redid Mr. Otero, put the bag over his head, uh, went over and then took Junior. Oh, oh, before that, she asked me to... Uh, to uh, save her son, so I actually had taken the bag off, and then I was really upset at that point in time. So basically, when Mr. Otero was down, Mrs. Otero was down, I went ahead and, and uh, took uh, uh, Junior, I put another bag over his head and took him to the other bedroom at that what, time. What did you do then? Uh, put a bag over his head, I put a, a cloth over his head, a t-shirt and a bag so he couldn't tear a hole in it, and uh, he subsequently died from that. And then when I went back, uh, Josephine had woke back up. What did you do then? And I took her to the basement and eventually uh, hung her. Are right, you hung her in the basement? Yes, sir. Right, did you do anything else at that time? Yes, I, uh, I had some sexual fantasies.
that was uh, after she was hung. All right. What did you do then? We went through the house, uh, kind of cleaned it up. Uh, it's called the right hand rule. You go from room to room, uh, picked everything up. I think I took uh, Mr. Otero's watch. There, I guess I took a radio. I uh, I forgot about that, but apparently I took a radio. Why did I you got, take these things? I don't know. Um, I have no idea. Just uh, what happened then? I uh, got the keys to the car. In fact, I had the keys, I think, earlier before that because I wanted to make sure I had a, a way of getting out of the house and uh, clean the house up a little bit, make sure everything's packed up and left through the front door. And uh, they went there, went over to their car and then drove over to uh, Dylan's, left the car there, and then eventually walked back to my car.